mm-hmm. and uh, when they flip the format. That's over. nice when you've got graphics to illustrate. Oh, yeah. Like well, that. that helped us because I we had no clue. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, I know I, I can guarantee you the numbers have not shifted favorably for us since we made the flip to AM because we went from a 100,000-watt FM station at night down to about an 8-watt station. <laughs> I know for me, you know, I live in Rochester, and when you guys went from 100.3 or whatever to 11.30 a.m., I get crackle now, when I, and I can only get you in my car. Right. Mm-hmm. That really sucks. So if, well, it, mm-hmm. if it wasn't for the Internet, um, I wouldn't be able to listen. So I appreciate the it, Internet it's a, a lot. It's a 50,000-watt AM station during the day, now daytime hours. But then at night, like most AM stations, with the exception of very few, it has to go down under 20,000 watts. And it doesn't get much of anywhere with that, especially depending on weather conditions and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it was a big change, and it's a big hit. We can tell, we, we don't tell directly through ratings, but we definitely tell through uh, through phone calls. We still light up the lines, but it might take a little longer than usual. Yeah, right. before I'd, I'd be in the midst of giving the phone number, give us a call now if you want, 651-989, and the phone lines would all light up. And I'll they already the, know the phone number. I'll give the phone number, and I'll look at Mally, and I go, oh, crap, and there's one line flickering. And then all of a sudden, 10 seconds later, there's three lines flickering, and 60 seconds later, all six lines are lit up. But it's like before, it was just bang, and they'd all be blazing. But thankfully, with things like iHeartRadio, which has been huge, and Stitcher Radio, and all of these different streaming sources, people can now listen to us from their cell phones, from their smartphones, from their tablets, from their everything so it's made it a lot easier to, to access our show which has made us you know a bigger threat and you know people are finding us now and spreading the word and keeping it out there so very cool let's get back to Mally <laughs> we were talking about uh, the voice of sanity so what is your role uh, on the show <laughs> as far as uh, your co-host roles uh, it's probably not sanity <laughs> 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 I, I chime in once in a while and I I'll sometimes bring the woman's opinion but uh, mostly I'm just... Are there a lot of women um, uh, listeners out there that have yeah. questions about relatives or deceased pets or things like that? I would think so, especially when we um, open up the lines for uh, psychics or uh, angel readers. We get a lot of women. But I'm amazed, though, that we actually get a lot of guys, too, but it's more women, I well, think. The, the demographic definitely for this show is probably 70% yeah. women. Before I would have I would have put it at 80, 80 to eighty five percent women based, but we're picking up more and more guy listeners, mm-hmm. men listeners, you know, across the globe. So it's it's kind of cool to have. Uh, I think it's getting closer to that fifty fifty ratio, because I think guys are getting more into it, but women are more open to the paranormal. I think so. That's why they're a little bit more apt to join us and have fun. Sure. Plus. We get these two hunks of man meat. I, I, I know, right? That's probably why the <laughs> women are drawn to the show. So um, let me ask you about um, the um, uh, your uh, darkness uh, uh, show. I'm sorry. Um, the Travel sh- uh, Channel show, Paranormal Challenge, you uh-huh. filmed that last year. Right. Can you tell me about what that project was all about? Well, Paranormal Challenge, you know, doing the radio show, we've had a lot of different opportunities that have been afforded to us, and do you want to do this? Would you be interested in that? And I have, you know, being a part of a paranormal investigation show now would freak me out just because there's so many people looking to just destroy your career if you go out there and, and, you know, think every mouse fart is a demon and, you know, every scratching branches is uh, grandma's soul coming up to, you know, reclaim you for the family tree. I don't know, it's just bizarre stuff. So when they came to me and they said, we want you to be a judge watching other paranormal teams and pointing out what mistakes they make and what's going on in the field and we're going to kind of put the spotlight on on that aspect do you want to do this i said yeah that'd be great and uh, they brought me in and then they said well who do you think would be other great judges for you you know to work with so i gave them a list of about 20 different people uh, including dr michael Shermer from skeptic magazine uh, who came on and did uh, i think one of her final episodes so it was it was a great opportunity to work with uh, you know uh, some of the legends in the field and, uh, you know, just have a chance to kind of judge and watch the way teams interact with each other, collect evidence, and, and present the paranormal. Sure. How many episodes was it? Twelve episodes. Is there any push to maybe do it again? You know, reality TV is about doing it on the cheap, and our show was an expensive show to do. I mean, there was a lot of cast. We probably had like 40 to 50 cast or crew members uh, behind the scenes setting up and, you know, getting lighting and electricity and and, and everything to these old desolate locations. So I think it was probably just not, 
price conducive to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, certainly if they call me and want to do another season, I'd be happy to jump on board. But at this point, I think they're looking for, uh, you know, when you can take three guys like Zach, Nick, and Aaron and throw them in a building by themselves with two cameras and they come back with an hour's worth of TV show, or you've got to now foot the bill for 40 people and, you know, Zach is your host and Dave is the judge and two celebrity judges and, you know, bringing in two different paranormal teams from different parts of the country. and A lot of logistics. Yeah, so there's a lot more involved in it. And I think it's just on the fly. People, you know, when you have shows like, uh, you know, Anthony Bourdain or, or uh, Ghost Adventures where there's one to three people in the cast and it's a lot easier to contain. It's just a cheaper way to go about doing it. Cool. So, what is the future of the show? I mean, do you have any future plans as far as as that goes? Are there any projects out there in the future? Right now, uh, just working on trying to extend the show into a two-hour format would be our main goal. But uh, we're also trying to expand and and get picked up in different uh, states uh, to make the show available nationwide uh, so that, uh, you know, other, other people can listen right on their terrestrial radio waves. Uh, so that's that's a big push that I'd like to start seeing by the end of 2012. I'd like to see that we we're on a station in California, Chicago, and, and New York. By the, you know, it's my goal by the end of this year is to have us in those three markets. You know, whether it's big stations or little, I just want to start breaking into the different networks and, and letting people know we exist. Sure. Final kick of the cat, I guess. Um, do you have anything uh, for the good of the order? Anything that you want your listeners to really know about the three of you and your show and, and what your goals are? <laughs> we just want you to come along with us every week, you know. I, I specifically, none of us really sort of research the information on the guests that we're going to have on. We keep Mally in the dark as much as possible. <laughs> no, seriously, just to, you know, for her... Sanity. Sanity. <laughs> well, no, but for, you know, to hear her actual reactions to things as they come through. And, and I don't learn too much about the guests until they're on the air with us, so that that way... We listen and we ask the questions that our listeners want to know. Because sure. the problem is when you're familiar with something, you forget to sometimes break it down and make it generic for everybody to, to feel like they're a part of the game. So we don't educate ourselves too much on each one of these topics. Now, over seven years, we've certainly educated ourselves a lot with the different topics so we can actually ask more intelligent and thought-provoking questions of guests. You know, cause you, So there, there's really not much... There's cryptids, you know, which is like Bigfoot, Loch Ness, and you've got demons, you've got angels, you've got ghosts, you've got poltergeists, you've got um, aliens and, and UFO abductions. So you've got about seven to nine topics. How mm-hmm. do you do that five nights a week for seven years and keep it fresh? You know, it's, right. it's all in the way that as we learn, we apply what we know to the different guests and, and we look for guests that have a different take on the subject. And thankfully, because there's always an evolving, moving... I think the paranormal is just this live form that just continues to evolve itself and change, and you start to grab onto it and think you've got it, and like sand, it just slips through your hands, and all of a sudden you're in a totally different perspective of what the paranormal is. And and, and there's all these great guests that are coming at it with totally different angles, and, and now you've got scientists and, and uh, psychologists that are throwing their hat in the ring and investigating these things, so you, you can start looking at it. So I just, you know, I think what people need to do is just keep tuning in and educating themselves, having fun with us, and uh, hopefully at the end of it all, they'll, they'll think of us as friends and, and continue to tune in. Very and to, cool. And to clarify, not not uh, knowing too much about a guest is not prepping. There's a difference. You mm-hmm. you do you know you're looking over a guest bio. You're looking over different angles, as, as Dave said, on how to attack that guest, and maybe a different angle to the interview that somebody else would do. For example, you get a lot of uh, crossover when it comes to guests and paranormal shows, even between our show and Coast to Coast. So we may have somebody on one week, and they'll pick our pocket a couple weeks later and have that guest on. But the the interview that Dave does is going to be significantly different in the interview that George Norrie does, mainly because Dave will take that guest, he'll kind of study a little bit of their background on the bio and say, hey, you know what, I'm going to take them in this direction tonight. This is where I really feel this is going to be the strongest interview. So not uh, not uh, knowing too much ahead of time is not the same as not prepping. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, have you ever had a guest that uh, has uh, said something or done something that is so radical that you, you have to throw the BS flag and say, you know what, I challenge that, that doesn't sound right. Or And how do you validate the things that people say? See, that's the important thing is you've got to look at it. I, I look at the, the paranormal like religion. There's Buddhists, there's Muslims, there's Christians, there's Jews. There's all these different perspectives. 
you know, it's like the, the elephant parts story. Everybody comes in and puts their hand blindfolded onto a part of an elephant. To each one of them, it's a totally different thing, right? Sure. It's a, it's a totally different deal, but you're looking at the same object. So for me to go in and bash somebody because they their ideas sound preposterous, and trust me, there's times, you know, people joke around about having, we, you guys should have webcams in the studio. You, we want to see you guys interact. Half the time we're in here going, <laughs> and, and laughing. You know, our guest last night was a perfect example. This moron comes on the show, and he's a demonologist with a mass comm and broadcasting degree. So you know where all the broadcasters go. Yeah. Well, okay, good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, taking his 9, 10, 11-year-old daughter out on paranormal investigations in, in horribly haunted places, and, well, she's got to learn to face demons. And Are you fucking nuts? <laughs> demons? But she's educated. I showed her how to use all the equipment. Yeah, yeah. and oh, that, that was his, yeah. his take on it. And I, I thought, this is insane. But, you know, I, I, said, I went after him a little bit. But then when I came back from the break, I go, listen, just so it doesn't seem like I'm cutting from both sides, I wrote a book about teenagers learning the ghost hunt. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to educate them, but, you know, just like I think it's important for my kids to understand what sex is, doesn't mean I should go out and buy them a hooker. Yeah. You know? Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I even threw the analogy at the guy. I said, why, why would you take her out in the field? Well, she's got to learn. And I said, well, I could teach my son how to clean a gun if I take him to Afghanistan, but I'd much rather do it at home. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know? I, I don't want to put him on the front line like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but then there's times that, you know, Tim's come after he goes, yeah, you let him off too easy, you let him off too easy, and, and I'll have listeners jump on me, you're too nice, and you got to, but then, you know what, the guy that sounded the kookiest to me, and, and was just, I probably should have gone after him a little harder, the next day I get 10 emails from people going, you know what, I felt so alone for so long, and I thought I was the only person dealing with this, and now I know that there's other people out there. Sure. And had I bashed him, I might have made those people feel ashamed or stupid. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. It's a hard line to skate, and that's you know that's where Tim will come in. Then we can play good cop, bad cop, because Tim has no problem calling bullshit on people and, yeah. being, and being rude mm -hmm. to them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about rude, but just basically <laughs> no rude. Basically, just calling just it like it is. I mean, you know. Yeah. What I keep trying to keep in mind too is is years ago Art Bell did a show with John Teeter, who was a supposed tri time traveler who came back in time and was in this era and then disappeared. Now, if you if you listen to those shows, they're some of the most intriguing radio you'll ever listen to. However, if you don't suspend your belief, then you're sitting there going, boy, this is six hours of BS and six hours I'll never get back of my life again, but a sure. tremendous story. So there may be times I'm sitting in the studio going, oh my God, is this a nut job? But at the same time, it may be an intriguing story. Sure. You know? Mally, any, any final thoughts? <laughs> this is Mally. <laughs> no final thoughts. Okay. You guys said it perfectly, so you I have know, nothing we, to add. We had a, I said we've never been disrespectful. We've had two guests that I'll say we've been disrespectful to. But we did it in the point that even while we were making fun of them, they were laughing along. We got <laughs> done with the show. They're like, God, that was great. Can I come back again? Yeah. And I, I was like, really? I just spent an hour t making complete fun of everything you're talking about. Sure. And they're like, yeah, but it was great. What a fun time. You guys are awesome. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> We Very had a cool. lady, lady that thought she was dating Satan. Yes. Oh no. Oh, that was a good show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, it was and, and you know, she started telling the story, and then we just started laughing along. You know, she tells me, "I go, well, how did you meet the Prince of Darkness, Satan, in physical form?" She goes, "Well, you know, I was I liked to dance, and I was looking for a dance partner, so I was reading in the Penny Saver, and he had placed an ad." Oh no! And Tim and I looked at each other, and I, Tim and I looked at each other, and I said, "Well, it's good to see that the economy has even hit the Prince of Darkness, and he's resulted in placing ads in the Penny Saver." Yeah, really. So, so, Miss contacts. Yes, exactly. The devil, uh, uh, Prince of Darkness, has uh, missed you at uh, the corner of uh, seventh. You were supposed to get hit by a car, but you were in Perkins. You, you, you decided um, to turn left instead of right, and so. If you still want to uh, just trip straight to hell, come back to... I saw you across the room in Arthur Miller's dance studio and couldn't resist. <laughs> well, I just want to uh, thank you guys for taking the time uh, to do this interview. It's, I, I'm fascinated by the genre and your show. Thank you. And um, it's, I'm, I'm a fan, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time. So uh, thank, thank you all very much. Well, thank, thank you, you for including us. Yeah. Cool. Yeah.